So I don't know if you've heard about Candida auris, um, and I'm also here to talk about infection control. So this is a new yeast species, which um, has been classified as newly emerging rather than a new pathogen. And the reason for that is because it was first isolated in Japan from the external ear canal of a patient in 2009 when the CDC went back and did a retrospective analysis of their strain collections, they found an isolate from South Korea, which was dated from, 2000, uh, from 1996. Um, it is now spread globally. Um, this information has come from the CDC, and it's in um, nine countries across four continents. And um, the problem with it is that you cannot diagnose it very easily in the routine laboratory, and it commonly gets misidentified. And so we don't really have a true idea of how prevalent this pathogen is because um, of the requirements for specialist um, laboratory testing. Um, and the CDC and Public Health England had a number of teleconferences in May and June 2016, and they issued joint alerts on the same, well, individual alerts, but on the same day um, in June. So infections have been documented across all um, age groups, including in um, neonates um, and in critical care units. And the major risk factor so far that has been identified is that if you're in an ITU for a long, long time. Um, the presence of central venous catheters, which all ITU patients have, is um, the second major risk factor. Previous antibiotics or antifungals um, is the next one, and um, as usual in a, um, with um, fungi, being immunosuppressed, so a hematology oncology patient, um, solid organ transplant patient, bone marrow transplant patient, um, or immunodeficiency patients are at greatest risk. D having diabetes is also an independent risk factor, and um, recent surgery, in particular in the UK, we're wondering about the role of cardiac surgery um, and spread of this infection, but we don't have the information. All of this work is still ongoing. So what type of infections do you get? It's been, um, infections have been identified from wounds, from years, and also from um, the vagina. Um, but a fair few patients have also had um, candidemias um, from the worldwide literature. Isolates have also been identified from the respiratory and the urinary tract. Um, but as yet, we do not know if this causes infections or whether it's just colonization that we're picking up. As you know, candida frequently colonizes the respiratory and the genital urinary sites as well as the mouth. So we don't know yet. Um, but I'm sure the data will emerge over the next few months and years. So what is the mortality? And why are we so worried about it? Well, the CDC figures suggest that the international mortality figures are 60%. However, in the UK today, the mortality figure is only 20%. And you might ask why there's a, you know, such a big discrepancy. The only hypothesis that I could put forward is that in the UK, the um, pathogen is not as resistant as it is worldwide. So at present, Public Health England have found that the isolate is only resistant to fluconazole. Having said that, Candida auris um, has this feature called epigenetic clustering, which suggests that it can develop resistance very quickly. Um, there's, we're also uncertain if there is an increased risk of death compared to other invasive Candida infections. Um, many patients have other serious comorbidities when you're in intensive care unit. I think that applies to all patients, really. Um, but again, this is an ongoing piece of work um, that the CDC um, and Public Health England are doing. So why worry about it? So The Guardian um, published this um, piece a few weeks ago where they had the headlines of millions of risks as deadly fungal infections acquired drug resistant. Now this is not, um, this is not um, Candida, it's um, Aspergillus fumigatus, which is a mold infection which um, classically affects immunocompromised patients. But the reason I'm highlighting it is because this is a new phenomenon. Antifungal resistance is fairly new in the UK. Um, it has been described across Europe, um, particularly from st studies in the Netherlands. But in the UK, it's, it's not something that has been widely published. And the fact that Canada Auris has now also presented in the UK is particularly worrying um, because it's presenting in a healthcare setting where you 
the patients they are less immunocompromised, the types and the degree of immunosuppression they have is totally different to those in the classical hematology, oncology, or transplant group. Um, and so that's worrying. It's often multidrug resistant. And as I mentioned before, it's difficult to identify using standard laboratory methods and um, misidentification has led to inappropriate treatment. It causes invasive um, infections with high mortality and um, it has been causing outbreaks in healthcare settings and rapid identification is important. So, the conventional techniques that we use in the laboratory, such as fungal culture of um, blood or other body fluids, doesn't identify Candida auris. It co commonly gets misidentified as um, other yeast species, such as Candida hemolunii, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or Rhodotorula. Uh, and this can lead to inappropriate treatment and difficulties in controlling infections. So, molecular methods is the way forward using either mass spectrometry or um, sequencing. So how did infections spread globally? The CDC has performed whole genome sequencing on isolates from Southern Asia, Eastern Asia, South America, and Southern Africa. And they have found that the isolates within a region are roughly very similar, but the isolates across different regions vary um, quite um, largely. And so they have postulated that Candida auris has emerged across different regions at the same time. But the cause for this is unknown. The hypothesis is that it's because of increasing antifungal selection pressure um, in humans, in animals, or in the environment, which is, you know, we link back to what some of our, my colleagues have said previously. So I'm not just going to talk briefly about spread in hospitals. We all work in infection control. Um, so we're still learning how Candida auris spreads. Um, at least four countries, including the UK, have described healthcare outbreaks of Candida auris infection and colonization. Um, in each of these outbreaks, which have occurred in India, Pakistan, Venezuela, and the UK, there have been more than 30 patients um, affected. And analysis from these clusters demonstrate a high degree of criminality within the same hospital, which suggests that the ISIS is being transmitted within the hospital, um, but the precise mode of transmission is unknown. However, the high degree of criminality within the same healthcare facility suggests that the spread is occurring through contaminated environmental surfaces or fomites, or else it's person-to-person -person spread, hands. And um, the high use of agency and bank staff in clinical areas, it has been thought that this may contribute to high standards not being maintained. And also, in, in a trust in the UK, difficulties in recruiting to senior nursing posts may lead to a lack of visible leadership and lack of assurance of standards being maintained. And I think it's the same old thing with any major outbreak. These are still the same things over and over again. It doesn't change. So you may have seen the news headlines of, of July, August. Intensive care unit closed after new deadly superbug emerges in the UK. And deadly superbug shuts down ITU at major London hospital. It's life-threatening in the intensive care situation and patients' immune system are down. And if you're already at death's door, which is often the case in intensive care, then this is really bad news. So just to talk about the outbreak in the major London intensive care unit, this outbreak started in April 2015, so it's a long outbreak. 50 patients um, as of a few weeks ago, 34 of whom were colonized, 13 were infected, and um, a further three who were infected who have died. The ITU was closed partially for 11 days in June 2016. Um, why was the ITU not closed before? Well, this is a very specialist tertiary referral center. Um, it was not easy to shut the ITU. Um, and more recently, there's been an update um, as of the last, um, the August bank holiday weekend of um, a further four cases. But this time, not in the intensive care unit, but in another ward. So the, the number of cases is now 54. 
So I think this should, tells you, from our experience in the UK, that this organism is, is colonizing the environment. It's, it's, it's quite difficult um, to clean. And I think that's where the problem is. I mean, that's just the UK experience. Um, and um, I'm just going to talk briefly about how you know, we are suggesting that you can prevent spread. A lot of this is not evidence-based, because the evidence isn't out there. Um, but the main factors in this Public Health England document that, that I'm going to talk you through is the decolonization of the patient, screening of patients, the patient factors, um, environment and fomites, and waste and linen disposal. So there's no evidence currently to establish whether Candida auris is susceptible or resistant to chlorhexidine. Work is ongoing to look at this. Um, but the recommended strategies for managing the infection is strict adherence to central venous lines and um, peripheral venous lines, um, the care bundles, um, tracheostomy um, care bu site care bundles, and um, urinary catheter care bundles. Um, skin deal contamination and mouth gargles with chlorhexidine washes is recommended. And um, there's also been the suggestion that if it is, you're finding it difficult to um, get rid of colonization, that you could try topical nystatin and terbinafin in combination. Um, say, for example, um, at central venous catheter sites. My only concern about that advice is that will it select out for antifungal resistance? I don't know. I think it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on you know how bad the infection is um, and in your unit, if you have an infection. So a screening policy, again, Public Health England have recommended that you um, have a local screening policy um, based on your local risk assessment. Um, so not, it's not one size fits all. And screening is recommended in units that have ongoing cases of colonization. So it's not just one hospital in the UK. It, ha it has occurred in a few different hospitals in the UK. Um, and screening is also advised for patients coming from affected hospitals. Um, either from in, the unit, um, in the UK or abroad. And you can look at the screening sites, and when I saw that, I thought, my goodness, you know, how can the NHS afford to do that? Um, and again, this has to be on your local risk assessment. Um, the trust that is, has a, had all that cases has been doing um, screening of all these sites. Um, and, you know, they, they got funding because they had to. Um, and then, as for every... HCI um, for de-isolation, you need three consecutive negative screens um, taken 24 hours apart. So for the patient then, <coughs> the isolation of all colonized and infected patients, all patients who um, have been transferred from an affected UK hospital and all patients who have been transferred from abroad, ideally single rooms, um, ideally en suite if you have them. Strict adherence to standard precautions, again, hand hygiene, um, soap and water, and, and using alcohol hand rub at the end, um, using of um, gloves and aprons, um, visors and masks are not advised unless you, um, there's risk of splashes or spillages. And um, visitors, I mean, ideally try to restrict visitors, otherwise they need to be educated. Um, there, there have been um, leaflets um, prepared at the hospitals that have been affected, which have been distributed to um, visitors about the infection and about um, you know, hand hygiene practices um, and, and using gloves and aprons. So then, just to talk briefly about the environment and fomites, because we think this is where the spread is occurring and we're not getting on top of it. The, it, the recommendations are that you use a chlorine-based um, 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 product and um, again, individualize it depending on the level of contamination and the caseload. Um, Training of domestic staff, as you all know, is, is critical. And um, if the patient's going to theater or for imaging, as usual, make sure they're under the list. The only thing to mention here is that the recommendations that have come up from PHG have said that use hydrogen peroxide. I would also suggest that you can use UV light, um, but for things like um, the MRI, you can't use either hydrogen peroxide or UV light um, because the, the, the magnets. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. Um, and then, you know, pay particular attention to um, multiple use equipment, um, such as um, mattresses and pillows. Um, ultrasound machines, um, thermometers, stethoscopes, or blood pressure cuffs. Waste and linen disposal. 
Again, follow this um, to the book. Um, I don't know what effect water saving technology will have on this, um, but also don't use clinical hand wash sinks um, for infected um, or discarded um, material. And in pediatric and neonatal units where spread has occurred, also pay specific attention to um, disposal of soiled nappies. So Public Health England are about to commence on a point prevalence survey because there are a lot of unanswered questions um, on Candida auris and how it's spread and why it's so difficult to um, eradicate it from the environment. And um, so we're looking at intensive care units and also at um, other high risk settings. And we're proposing to start this in November 2016. And if you're interested in your trust participating, um, please send me an email um, at that email address. And um, that's it from me. Thank you.